In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As our reading picks up, Jesus had just released a young boy from demonic possession. We had that text last week. In it, we saw that he had driven out an evil spirit that had attempted to kill this boy both by means of fire and water. This possession brought all kinds of terror and torture to him and to his family. It tested his father's faith, pushing him to the point of desperation, begging Jesus to do something if he could. In this encounter, Jesus pointed to the reality that salvation does not come by great amounts of faith, indicating instead that forgiveness is granted to all who believe, no matter how much or how little. Do you remember what the Father said to Jesus? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Well, Jesus responded. In fact, all he did to drive that demon out was to tell it to leave and to never come back. And it had to listen. There was no other option because of the authority that Jesus holds even over evil. All of this is quite amazing. But we also note that this demon would not respond to the rebukes of the apostles. The boy's father was greatly relieved when he came to Jesus, noting that no one else could do anything about the situation or resolve the problem. The apostles had tried and failed, and they watched on in bewilderment as Jesus' exorcism was successful and complete. Why could we not cast it out, they wondered. Gave them something to think about, didn't it? And then, as they were traveling on from there with Jesus and had passed through Galilee, he had something important to share with them. He did not want anyone to know, Mark tells us, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask. Well, he had just told them how he would win salvation for each of them and for all people. He gave them in plain words what would be required of him in order that forgiveness would come to sinful people. This was not a parable. There was no mystery in what he shared. He told them very clearly he would be arrested, killed, and raised in three days. He told them exactly how he would demonstrate perfect, self-giving love by means of sacrifice, and that through this he would bring about salvation from sin and death. But the disciples did not know what to make of it, so they didn't ask him about it or even talk about it. Instead, they took the conversation in a completely different direction. And what direction was that? Well, upon their arrival in Capernaum, the all-knowing God asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Oh, you heard that, Jesus? You knew we were talking? Well, uh, we'd rather not say. None of them wanted to admit to the topic of conversation. They kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, this is just a guess but I am thinking that this argument among the disciples was not a quiet one. Having recently been present for a Bears-Packers game in a house filled with Packers fans, there was plenty of debate there as to which of those two teams is the greatest. I, of course, kept a, a quiet and respectful demeanor, but I must say that almost everyone else got pretty loud when it came to asserting that the Packers are the greatest team. And while I wasn't keeping track of everything that was said, I observed that these Packers fans got significantly louder about the discussion when the Bears would score and take the lead. Oh, no, 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 the Packers are better. Yeah, 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 they're going to win, and and this doesn't count, and and this isn't going to last. Well, as we return to the disciples, we see that rather than delving into the details of their teacher's willingness to set everything aside and die to release mankind from sin, they were debating about which of them was the greatest. 
Remember, this was probably only a few hours after each one of them had been shown to be powerless against a demon that only Jesus was able to cast out. And they saw that he did it quickly and easily. So they all knew that Jesus was the best. But who came next? Which of them was a fitting second in command for the omnipotent God in human flesh? Who was worthy of being Jesus' right-hand man? We look at this and we probably shake our heads. And as we do, we look past our own ridiculous sin. Not only do we fight and fail against our inner desire to be the greatest, but we also regularly fall short when it comes to not elevating ourselves and our personal desires over the triune God who has created, redeemed, and continues to sanctify us as we live in this world. We daily sin much. We daily break the first commandment, creating and constructing false gods in our lives that we so quickly bow down to. But these false gods don't look like carved animals or graven images as they did in Old Testament times with the people of Israel. Instead, they look like our schedules or our hobbies. These false gods are our income and the good gifts from God that we cast aside and attempting to make even more. They are our comfort, our fears, and countless other incarnations of our selfishness and our desire to make ourselves and what we want to matter more than anything. We embrace these dangerous and damning gods, and we open up the door to our own condemnation. Like the apostles in their travel conversation, we see ourselves as far higher and more important than we should. But look back. Look to the reality of your own conception and birth. Neither of those events had anything to do with you, and neither took place outside of sin's stain. King David reminds us that we are sinful from the time our mothers conceived us, and as such, we are not greater than anyone or anything for which the same is true. So stop looking at yourself as the greatest living being on this planet. Stop looking at the people around you and finding some false comfort that they are worse sinners than you, or their lives aren't as put together as yours or they just can't seem to come up with anything but excuses for the many ways they disappoint you or disgust you. Conversely, we must also stop thinking that because our lives are broken or difficult, or because nothing seems to go our way, or because those around us seem to have everything handed to them, well, they must be better, or they must have more favor with God. Neither of these views is anywhere near true. Both of them represent the disgusting sin which the disciples were entrenched in on their journey toward Capernaum. Both of them point to what Jesus utterly destroyed in the midst of his apostles, in the midst of their silence, after he asked them what they had been talking about. Well, they didn't want to tell him the topic of conversation, but by refusing to do so, they were also foolishly hoping that somehow This man before them who had demonstrated powers that only the creator of this world could hold was at the same time unable to discern the subject of debate. And like we've said and discussed, we can probably guess that these guys were quite boisterous as they argued for themselves to be the greatest. No doubt they were citing various miracles that they had accomplished by the power given them by their Lord, and they were likely taking credit for each one. They all thought that they were a follower without whom Jesus would be reeling and in trouble. And they were all wrong. And so are each of us. If we think that there is something, anything, in us that God cannot function without, we are looking past the very assurance that Jesus had been foretelling His disciples of. We need the cross. We don't need our pride or our selfishness, or our desire to be the greatest. None of this has any value to the Lord. Nothing we have or can offer has any value to Him at all when it comes to our salvation. He has done the work. He has sent His Son to suffer for our sins and to remove them by His death 
and resurrection, that work has been completed. It is finished. So we must stop that debate. We must be silenced in the same way that the apostles were. <clears throat> and how did this take place? Well, Jesus sat down and called the twelve, and He said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And He took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in His arms, He said to them, Whoever receives one such child receives Me, and whoever receives Me receives not Me, but Him who sent Me. Well, that ends that. Jesus put them in their place. We can look at them and we can see their foolishness. We can condemn their pointless argument and their joke-worthy jockeying for a position that doesn't even exist. In God's view of humanity, there are those who believe and have faith, even a small or minuscule amount by human scales, and those who do not. Those who do not believe are on that, those who are on the narrow path of salvation, those who have been called by name at the baptismal font and can confess the faith given them there with even a shred of confidence or trust, are the very same whom God has chosen to share that faith with those who don't yet believe. And at the same time, those who believe now are those who did not at some point and would not outside of God's eternal grace and all-powerful work. We are not saved because we earned it. We are not saved because we deserved it. We are not saved because we are greater than the people around us. So take a look around. As you do, you must realize that you are surrounded by equals. And look at me, and you'll see another. Not a single one of us is of more or less value to the Lord. How can we know this? Well, we see it in Jesus' words and His illustration by taking that young child into His arms as a demonstration of worth. And yet we see it all the more at the cross. Jesus Christ, the second person of the eternal Trinity, took on human flesh and came into this world, this sin-filled, pride-powered debate hall of who matters more, in order to turn it upside down. He willingly robed Himself in our frail flesh so that He might redeem it and make it clean and set it free from the curse of sin that looms over us and in fact lives in us. He suffered and died on the cross so that our suffering in this life and the death that awaits us will not end up being greater than we are or besting us. So which of us is the greatest? Which of us is the best? Jesus Christ laid down His life so that we would not entertain such trivialities. Instead, He demonstrated that each of us is equally valuable and important to Him, from the smallest and most seemingly insignificant to the people that possess all kinds of power and prestige. Not a single one of us here matters more to the Lord and as such, we are not to think otherwise about ourselves. Jesus took a small child, a young person that was no doubt completely dependent on the work and provision of loving parents, and He said that we are to look at ourselves in exactly the same way. So let's stop seeing ourselves as something that we're not. Let's stop looking at people, at the people we know and live by here in this area and in this life, and seeing something that they're not. Everyone matters to our Lord. His gift of salvation is open to all people equally, and it comes to all people in the very same way, through the proclamation and reading of His Word, through the promises delivered in holy baptism, which connect us to Christ's death and resurrection, and through the ongoing forgiveness that is shared with us from the altar as we eat and drink Christ's true body and blood in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. With these promises, to which we are connected week in and week out, let's put away our pride or our shame and bring all people here so that they might see and be connected to these very same promises. Amen.
Our service continues now with the singing of the Te Deum that's found on page 223. Please rise. <laughs> 